Greetings. You're there. You're there. I'm here. Are we in the right place? I got like three different reminders. I don't know. I actually just uh, popped out because I thought, well, maybe I'm not in the room, right room, but I've gone into three different places and I finally found you. Okay. So this is 8452. And this one is 8452. So that's good. 3602. Yep. So oh, that, uh, the registration one is correct. And oh, hi, Fran. Sorry. Hi, Shelly. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Isn't it funny when we start talking and the mute is on and it's like it's our first time over and over and over again? Many, many times over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to go off camera because I'm making my lunch. No Good problem. Time. Okay. Um, hi, Sarah. Nice to meet you. Hi. You too. I'm an engagement partner at the um, and I support the Bella Bella and Bella Coola um, communities. Oh, oh, yeah. hmm. oh, and I went and pressed a button now and I can't see myself. Oh. Am I there? Can you see me? <laughs> settings. Hey, hey. Should be working. I just maybe can't look here. Ah, I'm back. Ha <laughs> ha. And you've got the master and commander. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to see what else we need to do here. Because I could only find one link, even if you were a presenter or anything, it all seemed to be the same. Okay, that should be correct. Um, let me just double check what we've sent out to everybody else to make sure we're on the same thing. I went through a different invite as well, so I've done it. Okay. 8944602. Oh, and there's David. Yeah, great. And yep, all our different invitations seem to have the same. Yeah. Hi, David. Hello. Sarah, I'm so sorry, but I just got your email now about sending the guidebook and info book. And I actually, so I have it, but I don't have it to send to everyone. I apologize. Not a problem at all. I'm sorry for the last minute. It's all good. It's just been a morning of meetings. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. It's been a week of meetings, it feels like. <laughs> Can you believe it's March? It's just nuts. <laughs> All right, we're just waiting for more folks to log on. Yeah. 
we have upwards of 37 registrants. Hi everybody and welcome. We're still just waiting for folks to sign on. Dr. Stoles, who is our host today, is also working today. And so might be a, what did he say? Tidge light, smidge light, Shelly? <laughs> Okay, so I'll tell a healthcare joke while we wait. Are you ready? So a man gets on the phone and he's frantically calling the hospital and he's like, my wife is in labor, my wife is in labor and, or no, um, and it, the contractions are two minutes apart. And the hospital says, is this her first child? No, it's her husband. <laughs> Anybody else got one while we're waiting for folks to log on? My wife doesn't allow me to tell jokes on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got quite a few folks here. We're just waiting for a few more. So feel free to finish your last bites or first bites of lunch. And we're just waiting for folks. Okay, and here's a one-liner. Eight out of 10 injections are in vain. <laughs> Do you have one of those joke of the day calendars on your desk, Shelly? No, I have Google. Uh, right, we're no longer in the world of, uh, of paper. So no. for those who just joined us, we're just waiting for a few more folks to log on. And um, we are also waiting for our host, Dr. Solz, who's working today. And um, so he's just wrapping up with what he's doing there. Thank you all for being here. Really great turnout. And I'm just trying to get my screen sharing to work here so that we are ready to roll. Just while we wait, how many people that are online have actually been impacted by natural disaster over the past couple of years? If you're off camera, even maybe raise your hand. Yeah, it's, it's a world, isn't it? That'd be a great question to put into a poll. <laughs> yeah. I wonder yeah. if we could do a quick round table just to do some introductions while we're waiting for John. Sounds oh. great. Um, let's start with Graham. Which one? Well, just because I had my hand up and I was slow, hey? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, good, good afternoon, morning, whichever time of day it is, everyone. Um, yeah, good, interesting question, right? Who's been impacted by natural disasters? 
Uh, my first was uh, 97, 98 in Salmon Arm, wild card. We had to evacuate a hospital. Um, so I'm a family doc. I'm a disaster medicine doc uh, in Kamloops. Uh, and I'm the position lead for the Thompson Division. Great. I have Rhonda next on my screen. Look at that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rhonda Eden. I'm also with the Thompson Division. I am a network lead with the uh, Thompson Division, but I'm also the project lead alongside my physician lead, Graham, uh, for our shared care uh, emergency uh, work. Great, thanks, Rhonda. Uh, Chelsea. Which one, me or Brooks? <laughs> oh, let's go with you. Um, I'm Chelsea McKinney and I'm a practice support program coordinator coach and I'm joining from the Shkretnik Nation today. I'm in Kamloops and I also support rural and remote communities. Thanks for having me join today. And Chelsea Brooks. Hi, I'm the practice development lead at the Thompson Region Division. I actually saw this webinar was in Rhonda's calendar and then I Googled it and it had an open registration. I feel like I'm crashing a little bit. I didn't realize it was gonna be a small group, but uh, yeah, at, like I am involved in this work from a division standpoint and um, I'm doing a master's right now. My research is looking at physician experiences during fire and flood. So very applicable to uh, professional and academic life. Well, we're happy to have you, Chelsea. You're not crashing at all. Uh, there are actually supposed to be about 37, 40 people in this. We're just waiting on a few. I'm sure some are in the middle of their practices at the moment. Uh, Carolyn. Hello, it's Angela Pounds and Carol Farr. We're joining you from Tsunami Territory on Gabriel Island. Um, we have had a couple of I don't know if you call them natural disasters, but they sort of are. One ice storm and one barge both times took out the power to our island for the entire island for about five days. So thanks for having us. Great, thank you. Uh, Beth. Hi, everyone. Joining from Hazleton, unceded Gitsan territory. Um, slow internet connections up here, so just keeping my video off, but nice to see everyone. I'm the chapter coordinator. Um, and support the physician and nurse practitioner midwife group in Hazelton. Thanks, Beth. Cheryl? Good morning, morning or afternoon now. <laughs> it's right on that cusp. Uh, my name's Cheryl. I know many of you because I used to work with Rural and Remote Division as the chapter coordinator in Pemberton. So um, lots of familiar faces. I now work with doctors at BC as an engagement partner supporting uh, some of the communities in the interior and kind of the provincial contact with rural and remote. Um, I'm calling from the unceded traditional territories of the Shaquetmik Nation in Kamloops. Um, I, I should have raised my hand for being impacted, certainly. I mean, uh, like being in Kamloops and everything was really um, around us also this this summer, but I um, I, I am, we, we were certainly fortunate in that we didn't have to evacuate. We had, we had, you know, like probably everybody on this call, everything ready, but we were fortunate in, in that regard, so. All right, Christine. Um, it, Christine's with me, but her computer doesn't have audio, so she says hello. Okay, Krista. Hi, I'm Krista Sandberg. I am the transformation lead looking after IHUS, and I'm calling in today from the Shrek Nation, so have, uh, in Kamloops. Happy to be here. Great. Thank you. David? Uh, David Dirksen, uh, Chapter Coordinator for Ashcroft. Uh, We've been really lucky uh, in that the disasters have been all around us. And uh, the only challenge we've had is that we couldn't go anywhere, <laughs> whether it was fire or flood, the roads were all closed and <laughs> we couldn't evacuate or do anything, but we didn't have to. Thanks, David. Uh, Diana? Hi, everyone. Diana Penny, Chapter Coordinator in Fort Nelson coming to you today from the traditional territory of Treaty 8. Hey, Fran. Oh, sorry. Hi. 
Um, hello, I'm Fran Hopkins. I'm an engagement partner with the Doctors of BC and I support the communities of Bella Bella and Bella Coola. Um, previously to this work, um, I was involved in some evacuation work in um, some remote First Nations communities in the Pemberton area. And I'm currently um, observing um, very closely some floods that are happening in my hometowns back in Australia, which have been catastrophic. And I have lived through um, several floods myself. And I'm calling from the unceded ter traditional territories of the Lilwat Nation and the Squamish Nation in Whistler, BC. Thanks, Fran. Uh, Graham Gillies. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, zooming in from uh, unceded Coast Salish territories here in Surrey, BC. I work with uh, the New Hulk, uh, unceded uh, New Hulk territory and uh, Bella Coola community there. Um, my experience with natural disasters has been more than I would like, but um, 2017 wildfires, I was in communications. Uh, role with the Site Coteen National Government during the uh, Williams Lake wildfires and, and uh, everything that happened uh, that year. And then with Bella Coola last year, there was a number of roads being cut off and it's sort of one road out. Um, so yeah, multiple emergencies as well as tsunami warnings and things like that. So this is something I'm really interested in. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Catherine. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. I'm the Interior Regional Manager with the Rural and Remote Division of Family Practice, working very closely with Sarah on a regular basis. And um, I'm calling in today from the traditional territory of the Shwetmuk, the Tanaha, the Sinaiaks, and the Silk. I personally, same thing as a few of you have obviously experienced what we did in the interior this summer with uh, just smoke and fear of being um, trapped. So being in Revelstoke, we only have a couple ways out. And if those are closed, which they often are, um, it can be a little bit nerve wracking. So thinking a lot more about that moving forward and just with young children and what that might look like, should we ever actually need to evacuate or do so in a hurry? Um, I actually grew up in the States and, and have been through several very large earthquakes in my childhood. So that was kind of my memory of natural disasters back then. Um, yeah, and that's it, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Oh, thanks, Rhonda. Sorry, just uh, off camera having my lunch, sparing you from that. Uh, my name is Leanne Morgan. Um, I have a pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Remote Division, and I'm here for uh, zooming in from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Um, I, I have not had direct involvement in a number of the emergencies that have happened over the last year. Uh, from just a very remote um, vantage point, providing administrative support to my colleagues and, of course, the physicians on the ground. Um, but also my direct personal experience has been with unnatural disasters like arsons and cocaine factory explosions from my previous life. So uh, anyway, look forward to the session today. Thanks, Leanne. Just for the folks who have joined us, we're just doing a quick round table on who everybody is and if you've experienced a natural disaster in the past. Lucas Parker. Hi, everybody. Just grabbing some lunch here. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I work uh, supporting the GPSC uh, at the Doctors of BC. Uh, one of the things that we are working on for the coming fiscal year is funding for divisions around uh, emergency management, and emergency response. Uh, so that's why it uh, brings me to this call, really interested to hear the discussion. Um, I am calling from Victoria, the traditional territories of the Lagongan speaking people. Uh, and so haven't had that direct experience with the um, recent natural disasters um, and, and just um, witnessing that from afar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Narul. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Narul. I'm the attachment coordinator for Rural and Remote Division of Family Practice. Um, I started about four weeks ago, and um, I'm coming from the unceded um, Coast Salish Territory in Chilliwack. 
Um, we were cut off from the East and West. Um, I know a number of people were affected and impacted, and I was able to see and experience that um, while volunteering with St. John Ambulance. I know Abbotsford was a lot, um, you know, had it worse than us. Um, yeah, um, thank you for having me. Hey, Phil. Yeah, just uh, Phil Simpson, GP in Merritt. Um, so we had obviously the, the fires and the floods and pretty tough year and experienced patients indirectly with that, no direct uh, uh, kind of experience with the actual disasters themselves, but just dealing with a lot of the fallout. So interested about that. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Rhonda Robco. Hi, everybody. I am Rhonda. I am the chapter coordinator in Bella Bella, and I'm also the MSA coordinator in Bella Bella and Bella Kula. And I'm joining today from the territory, unceded territory of the Wee Wei K Nation on Quadra Island. Thanks, Rhonda. Uh, Shearer. Yeah, hi, this is Lorianne Shearer. I'm a physician in Bella Bella. Yeah, I saw this. Uh, the Zoom meeting pop up and I thought this could be interesting. You never know when a disaster is going to hit you. So I just wanted to hear other people's experiences. Our only use of, uh, you know, emergencies is every couple of years we get a tsunami warning and we have to evacuate the hospital, you know, up the road above the waterline. But uh, just interested to hear other people's experiences and what they did. So I know when we do have a big disaster. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have some new folks who've joined, uh, just to let you know, we're doing a quick introduction and letting folks know if you have experienced a natural disaster before, uh, Christine Dooley. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Chris Christine Dooley. Christine Dooley. Uh -oh. Had a bit of an echo there. I know. I think that's better now. I think I fixed it. Anyway, um, yeah, we went through a lot. We didn't get flooded ourselves here in the office, but it disrupted the office totally. And it was a real experience. And, um, and I just think it was a, a really hard experience for all the long-term care patients too, so. Thanks, Christine. Is Dr. McLeod with you? He's in the other room. Do you want me to go? I'll go get him. Uh, sure. Or is he on the phone or? I don't know. I'll have to go. I'm going to run to his office and tell him, okay? Okay. I'll get uh, on to somebody else in the meantime. Uh, Duncan. Hi, Duncan Ross, uh, GP in Merritt. And uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, as, a, as maybe everybody knows, we went through a big you know, big season of disasters this year, which was uh, really un unprecedented. Um, we have had floods here before that were fairly major and probably, you know, um, tough on in individuals, um, but it was nowhere near the scale of this in terms of destruction of, of, of actual houses and removal of lands and everything. Um, and then of course the summertime was, you know, fires and, <clears throat> um, Lots of stress with that, moving the patients out of the hospital um, uh, in preparation for that. So that's two two times this year we've evacuated our our, our hospital and long term care in fairly short order. I think it was more or less exactly uh, three months to the day. And uh, you know, mean meantime, everybody in the town is affected. I, I had uh, fence posts burning at my place, and and uh, yeah, just a a real head shaker when you look back on it. So certainly worth a review and thanks for uh, putting it on. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, Carl. Yeah, hi, it's Carl from Lilloet. Yes, uh, fortunately we've been spared disasters, but I'm sure they are on their way. So I thought it's really worthwhile to think about it. We all the minor things we have, we always move fully unprepared. So I guess we have to change our approach there a bit. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have Dr. McLeod? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. 
Uh, Dr. McLeod, can you just tell uh, folks who you are and uh, your experience of natural disasters? Yeah, um, well, for the natural disasters that we've had, I, I just kept working through them all. Uh, so not much change for me. It's just the services around me that seems to be sort of deficient. But um, I think with the medical care from the private doctor's offices, from my point of view, we just carry on the same thing. So for everything that's happened, we still show up at the office every day. I just, I just don't work weekends anymore, that's all. Thanks, Dr. McLeod. Uh, Shelly. Um, hi, I'm Shelly Sim, chapter coordinator for Clearwater, longstanding um, disaster survivor right back to 2000 with the first floods at the North Thompson River. And um, I know how to package a go bag just like that. Um, but I think in terms of the, the medical situation, it certainly gives a lens on the importance of this and why people need to be prepared and give their story. And I note that Dr. Souls is with us. So I wonder if we should um, move into, you know, starting with him before he gets called back to back to workers practice. Absolutely. I just want to see if there's anybody else that has not had the opportunity to introduce themselves. Get everybody. I'm Sarah Sadowski. I'm the chapter coordinator for Rural and Remote in Merritt. And I'm going to pass the torch over to John. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Sarah. Sorry I'm late. Uh, I made the mistake of actually working this week. I'm supposed to be mostly retired. So I'm in, uh, uh, I've been a physician in Clearwater for. 32 years, I think a whole lot of you know me, and um, I'm half retired or three quarters, depending on who's who's counting. Um, and uh, Clearwater is in the uh, uh, tradition on unceded territory, the Shkwetmik people. And Sarah, you had some slides. Do you want me to open them up or did you show them? Yeah. So the interesting date on this slide is actually the November 15th, um, because for those of you who don't remember, November 15th was the day that uh, um, Merritt uh, flooded out and Sarah, um, along with many, many other people was evacuated from that community and had to leave. And, uh, and so it just points out, I think, uh, uh, if, if nobody's mentioned it yet, just the, the combination of disasters that can occur in a given year. So this year, um, we've had the pandemic, of course, and, uh, and fires and, and then floods. And so there was some irony in the fact that a presentation about how we responded to, to uh, fires was um, interfered with by uh, floods. And so we're doing it again now when, when fingers crossed, there's no disasters except in Europe. Um, next slide, Sarah. And uh, yeah, so if any of you want to put an acknowledgement in the chat, that would be appreciated. Uh, um, our division in the interior is on the uh, traditional unceded territory of four uh, First Nations, including the Shkrepum, uh, the Inkaklatma, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the uh, Six and and uh, and the uh, uh, North and Staplium. Uh, next slide, Chair. Uh, and we can it, we can move on. Um, also, Duncan's here too. Yeah. So uh, I think people were talking about packing for disasters. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Really, really, what we want to talk about is is how is primary care affected? Um, what are there? What are our stories that came out of this? One of the things that we recognized is is during the moment, uh, during a disaster, we all respond to it. We all do what's needed, and uh, and in this particular case with the fires, all sorts of things were done by all sorts of people. Were done very effectively, um, and you know how you know when things are done well is nobody complains. And it's really unfortunate that the the way we know if things went well is that nobody complains, uh, because it seems to me that when things go well, uh, that people should be it should be noticed and uh, and people should be commended. So, for instance, I don't know the number of people Sarah may have that I, I used to have that number in my head as to how many people were 
um, uh, people in long-term care, people in acute care hospitals were evacuated from their communities uh, during the disaster, uh, found um, temporary homes elsewhere. And that was an enormous effort done by the health authority and so many other people in the community. And, and yet um, I haven't seen anywhere any real recognition of that. And so one of the things to think about is when things go well, um, think about who, who, who it is on the ground who's working to make that happen. Um, and, you know, primary care, we're going to have a, a, a discussion about, uh, hopefully Dr. Mo will come on and tell us what happened in, in uh, uh, Logan Lake. Uh, as we all know, Logan Lake was evacuated on very, very short notice. Uh, and Dr. Mo, we found a place for her uh, to carry on with doing her primary care work virtually. Uh, we, uh, 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 welcome. And, um, and so we're going to give uh, her a chance to tell her story because I think that's important. Um, and then we're going to hear from, uh, I'm not sure if, Sari, if you had a planned order, but we're, I think hearing from Dr. Mo first would be good. And then um, and perhaps from uh, um, Graham Dodd, who has an interest in disasters, if that's uh, not overly morbid, but uh, uh, we should he can give his point of view and uh, and then maybe Duncan can talk about more recent uh, disaster with the floods. Um, and if you will let me share my screen, Sarah, uh, I don't, I got to push this button. So you need to, you need to release it and then I can do it. All right. I want to show you, I want to show you a picture. course it's going to take forever because why wouldn't it well that picture is loading perhaps uh dr mo can introduce herself to the group dr mo just to let you know we uh have a couple dozen few dozen people online and um we had just done some introductions okay hello everyone um I'm a physician in Logan Lake, and um, um, I remember we got um, we had those meetings prior to the evacuation. Then in August, it was August 12th that uh, we got the call to leave the town, and I remember speaking with Rhonda and Ian Wood saying, you know. Um, what if we got evacuated because we've been on alert for like a month and then it was no for a few weeks then it was rescinded and then we went back on alert so we probably i would say we've been on alert for like two months so i remember the first episode we had then and um, for the alert and um, it was actually patients that interned me on what to do and um i remember some older patients of mine saying um are you packed i'm like do i need to get packed and they're like, yeah. Um, and then one of the guys were like, um, they remembered that they had like five minutes that the RCMP came knocking on their door, say, you've got five minutes to leave town. I'm like, oh, five minutes. So, and say, no, get things packed, your documents, pictures there to you, and all that. So, it was more for me packing because the building is owned by Interior Health. So, I didn't really have any personal stuff in the clinic, only probably my stethoscope and my phone and my bag. So, I knew I didn't really need to anything out of the building but of course it will be different from anyone who has a private practice they might want to consider um you know having that and i believe um there is a planned um thing going on regarding what to pack in a disaster mode now but then i didn't know what to pack so they intend me just pack you know things valuable to so things i did pack were more of my personal effects then so i remembered for like since june I had in the truck of my car boxes of my certificates. Those were the most important to me. And um, I had pictures, you know, my family pictures, wedding pictures, the albums, I had them in the box. And I picked a few clothes I knew because I have two boys, you know, things they needed. So their games, they had it packed in the car. So whichever one they want to use for that week, we go take it from the car and then return. So we didn't leave anything outside just in case we had to pack. So that, so that you have an idea of, 
the preparation we had even way before we had to leave the town. Um, medications, you know, we packed some food just in case because I didn't know where I would go to. And then I remembered we've been having those meetings and I told Rhonda saying, what if we were evacuated? What would be the plan? Where would I go to? And um, I remember a friend of mine that got evacuated then in 2017, she was at um, one of the interior health communities, I've forgotten the name now. And she said, while well, she had has that she was in the shelter and then she had to move to the hotel with her son then. So I'm like, okay, Rhonda, what do we do here? So we had the meeting on Friday, I think, or maybe a Wednesday. I remember it was few before we got evacuated. So we didn't really have like a solid plan scene, but I knew I was going to merit or something. So, and then I was in the clinic, we still having the meetings. Of course, it was scary. Clouds all over were orange. You would see the, you know, weeks before you see the hashes falling literally. When you want to open your car, door falls on your car, you just blow it out or use your hand to stick it off the car. So it was really, really scary. And uh, you hear news, oh, it's more closer, it's here now, you know, oh no, it's blown the other way. But of course we didn't know what to expect. So afternoon, I remember quite well about three o'clock-ish, um, August 12th, um, the MOE came knocking on my door saying, um, doctor, you have to leave now, you know. And earlier that day during lunch, we're like, when do we get to move? Is the hair quality even okay enough? Because it was all smoky. You could literally feel or smell the fire close to you, right? So we're like, when are we going to, you know, get moved? And um, she said, I think it's time. And of course, you've been, you think you will prepare for it, but I wasn't. So I remembered... I had to go back and forth. She's the washroom, like, oh, I need to put one on my face. I was pretty scared, you know, and she said, you have to move now. And then I picked my bag, we left together in the car that day, because I usually practice from the clinic every day. So I wasn't even at home, you know. So it was easier for me that way. And um, we left. And I remembered, who do I call? You know, I we already had our things packed in the car already. So, but of course, you still want to pick one of two things, you know, send a message to my husband saying, I think we all have to leave. And I sent a message to Rhonda on the day. I think it was a text message, Rhonda, or maybe a phone call, I can't remember. And I'm um, saying, it's happened. I'm heading towards merit because that was the um, safest road to go through. And um, I said, um, I'm just going to merit. I don't know who I'm going to meet there, but I'm just going to merit because they did tell us to leave the town through the in en route merit. So later on, they did say probably about for uh, Chiliwak was on one of the other places that people went to. Some went to Kamloops. So of course, Kamloops were already evacuated as well. They didn't have so much space. But I remember my Elma went to Kamloops to stay with our friends. So, and um, Rhonda was really, really, I would, you know, she really got right onto things. And um, she set up a, a message. And then, of course, on the way, the network was back. So we got lost in transition. But by the time I got to marriage, I got the text message. She had already con connected me to a few people in that group chat saying they already booked a hotel. I was surprised, you know, for us. And, um, and they, they were even much more. They talked to the extent of my children. I might need um, a care for my children so, so to show to the level that they did you know, think about, and um, um, I didn't really need it. My husband um, helped with that, and I had a little bit older so they could stay home. So they, we all stayed in a hotel. Um, remembering now, it's, I'm getting a bit emotional about it because um, it wasn't something that um, I would imagine happening again. So um, we went shopping then in, I think, Walmart, and um, you would see people have their trucks packed outside the vans, and of course, people from the town. So we knew each other, and we we're all like talking, saying, Oh, we don't know if we get a home to return to, but of course, we are safe, you know. And um, right there and then, you know, they had things set up. I was able to walk. I think that was on a Thursday, Friday, I didn't walk, but Monday, I was able to walk from the Merit Hospital and uh, got a room for me there. Um, most of my calls, a lot of people left their medications, uh, even habits, we had already had the, the alert. So for some reason, some left, some were in, in town when it happened. So they only had the effects that it took with them while they were out of town, because some people were working outside and then they live in Logan Lake. So those ones couldn't go back to their houses. 
And, um, but it was effective. The MOA wasn't able to work on maybe like a few days after from a Kamloops office, but um, everything was all set up. Um, it was a bit more tedious, but now with the new profile we have, it's easier because then I had to print out all prescriptions manually and then had to call the pharmacies one by one at the end of the day. So you would imagine saying I'm calling for these, you know, and um, I got way through it, you know, now put all Costco's together, put all Rexos together and then do the, that ball or rather than doing it, you know, one by one. And that part was easy. Referrals, um, some was successful because um, I couldn't print out to sign on some lab requisitions and all that. So some labs got, you know, allowed that. Some things which we had to work on, on when we got back. But I was in my head, I knew the wait time normally for the clinic was a long wait to, you know, two to three weeks now, it's even worse. So then I knew that I can't afford to hang off and not work completely because I know that the workload I will come back to will be a lot by the time I'm back in the clinic. So it was important because I was able to review test results, um, had to follow ups on investigations done, you know, few complaints also were done, but most people didn't really, they were really happy that they didn't even believe that could work under the circumstances, right? Because everybody was still in shock, right? Um, but I was still fairly able to um, walk through it. Of course, some phone calls, some had home phones on their, um, their chat so I couldn't reach some because the home phones were in Logan Lake but um, most people I was able to get through to at least I would say about 75 percent follow-ups were done referrals were made which was really good um, a few cancer diagnoses was even made at that time and which I was grateful for because I would imagine not been having access to to the patient at that time um, and um, overall the experience was good just because of the support I got from Rhonda and um, from the division, they were, they were amazing. I'll keep saying that, yeah. And um, the manager in Merit as well, I've been trying to say thank you, but I don't know how to say thank you. I would probably link Rhonda to say thank you to her because she was really helpful as well. And I remember there was a time that there was concern about, oh, now, they couldn't because then merit also got on the alert as well. So maybe in future, <laughs> when we want to have that evacuation, probably we'll plan for a space, you know, a location that might not also go on at alert because then I got panicked like, okay, so where do we move to now? You know, and I remembered, um, you know, they were able to, because we had to, look, you know, go to the ESS center. They were able to kind of give us coupons for the hotels and all that. And then because they went on a lot mode as well, they couldn't extend it. So the panic came then and of course, Rhonda helped again saying, I don't know what to do. I think we may have to leave and all that. So maybe in future, we may plan ahead and say, if you have been evacuated, then we'll likely go to a location that might not necessarily fall on the alert or whatever, far away from any other floods or fire or whatever um, after. And, but, you know, thinking back now, we are having plans in place. Um, because I think this might be different because this is an interior health building. So I might not necessarily need to take the computer because I was able to use my laptop, right? Um, I don't know how that would work for someone that does have a private clinic. So it will be all different in the approach to being evacuated, right? But we were able to come back. Um, they had their health assessment done in the building to see if it was safe too. Because even when we came back to town, we still had to like a week or 10 days before I could even come back to the to the to the clinic on its own, to the building on its own. So I was working from home. And of course, Logan Lake is known for, you know really bad internet services. So it was that one, that patch was also like that. But uh, overall it, it went well, um, really emotional time because uh, we didn't know that um, we had a place to go back to. And, um, but overall, I think we survived. Um, it was really emotional, it was well, but we're glad to be back in time, everybody's safe. And um, I will say thank you again, Rhonda and the division for helping. <laughs> Thank you so much. So how long were you out altogether for? Uh... Um, um, okay, so if I count in total, it will probably be up to like 20 days because we were away for about um, August 12, we can have it on my calendar, but I would say in total away from the clinic about 20 days there about, um, but we were out from evacuation mode because 
apparently the I learned the um they needed the workers back so that's why we came back it wasn't necessarily safe at that time like that so that's why we wouldn't walk straight from the building so but it's a fairly about 20 days that we were evacuated i have to check my calendar to see precisely how many days but um it was pretty long yeah, i think it was another 10 days after dr mo was back in the community that exactly. um that the clinic was closed for cleaning and and yes. that type of stuff so mm -hmm. yeah so roughly about a month because we didn't get back onto like um first week in august um first week in september to get back into the clinic building on its own yeah because interior health had to do those um cleaning um security checks and all that yeah but it will be different if it's a private clinic right so <laughs> yeah it will probably be faster and different yeah well th thank you for that i mean my understanding was that that uh basically the fire was stopped in the outskirts of Logan Lake and, and really no significant buildings were lost. Is that No, true? no. Um, yeah, of course, I would say we're pride in, you know, saying that Logan Lake is um, a fire. <laughs> um, they had that plan way ahead, you know, kudos to the mayor as well. So we are a fire safe community. And um, I think they did say that we are one of the local, you know, one of the small towns that did have that plan diet. So pretty much they had the sprinklers on most buildings, you know, everybody's um, <laughs> had the dry woods cleared up. They did dog grows close to the buildings, but it was pretty close, about maybe seven meters or so, even to the mayor's house. It was pretty close. Thank you. Okay. I, I wonder, um, Sarah, would it be useful for us to go through the timeline of, of the summer and how the fires developed? Because that's really what my map was directed at. Absolutely, you bet. Yeah. So this is a this is sort of a final. Now this is not one hundred percent accurate because it ha, it it's a map of hot spots between two two dates, but it really shows the circumstances in in the region that that were that we are all in here um, during the summer. And this you know this was actually the only the third worst fire season in BC, um, but for the in, in this piece of the interior it was by far the worst um the first evacuation alert in in um uh, thompson care who happened on april 19th if you can imagine there was a fire north of merit or west of merit um and uh if we all remember the heat dome so the heat dome started june 26th um uh, litton which of course is here uh uh, burned up that fire started there's several fires here there's the, the, the it, Litton Creek was the one that uh, uh, had burned up Litton um, the the White Lake uh, White Lake fire um, which is this one over here um, started on July 13th um, the Sparks Lake which is the one that burned across towards uh, barrier barrier is right there uh, this started just north um, north of ashcroft ashcroft is uh, in here um and it burned all the way across this piece that looks green was actually burned and that started uh, june 28th uh mckay creek is this one that started june 29th now uh, this was june 30th uh, Flat Lake, which is this one up here, um, kind of started July 8th. Uh, Tremont Creek, um, uh, which is this one here that almost burned Logan Lake down, started uh, July 12th. Um, and uh, the White Creek Fire, which burned over top of um, uh, Monty Lake, uh, is right here. And that's the one that burned all the way over to the Okanagan uh, Lake. Uh, there's a, a conditional fires. I can't remember the names, but there was one that almost closed Highway Three here, um, and uh, and there is uh, this is Flat Lake, and this is uh, south of Hundred Mile House. So it's worth thinking about where our communities are. So Logan Lake is right here, We're right at the very edge of that fire. The fire, as as uh, uh, Dr. Mo said, it burned within seventy meters of houses in Logan Lake, and the only thing I think that preserved. Uh, Logan Lake was that they had gone through this process of fire saving, uh, proofing the community to some extent. Clearwater was relatively safe. It was here. At one point uh, during the summer, Clearwater was the only community uh, in the 
Thompson area that actually did not have a either an alert or an evacuation. Um, Barrett did from this fire, Logan Lake we already heard about, Merritt had an evacuation alert from this fire here. All these communities, of course, here, including Chase, which is right there, had, had uh, sorry, right there, had an evacuation alert from there. Pieces of Kamloops had an evacuation alert from this tongue of the fire that was burning towards Kamloops. Yeah. It's also worth considering the transportation corridor. So Highway 5 goes south to Merritt and goes right through this fire here. Um, Highway 1 goes right through these fires here. Uh, Highway 99 goes from Lillooet east this way. And as I mentioned, Highway 3 was almost blocked here. Um, and the road to Prince George is right there. Uh, the road between uh, Highway 5 and Highway 97 goes right through here, just south of that fire. And it just shows how vulnerable, and the floods confirm that, how vulnerable we are to being uh, uh, cut off from, from the coast. Um, we've already talked about uh, uh, um, Logan Lake, but uh, of course, this fire here actually destroyed many places in, in the road that goes to, to Vernon. Vernon's over here. Um, and you look at that and you kind of go, wow, what didn't burn? Is there almost more that's burned than not burned? Not quite, but it sure looks that way. Uh, interestingly, in 2017, there was a fire right here that backs up against this one. Um, in this green area that you see around barrier, the barriers here, uh, this area was burned in 2007 and this fire here stopped at the edge of that fire. Um, I think it really points out our vulnerability. And uh, I think what we would probably want to hear from now is maybe um, uh, get the perspective from, uh, uh, from uh, Rhonda and Graham. Sure, John, thanks. You know, I look at that map and uh, while there's a lot of red, there's also a lot of green, which is potential fuel for the future. And the, 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 the screenshot behind me, that was July, uh, June 28th. So that was the start of the Sparks Lake fire. And I remember watching that and wondering what sort of year we were going to have uh, this year. And of course, we all know what happened. Um, you know, I, I, there's sort of four things I just want to sort of uh, mention and I'll let Rhonda uh, take things from there. But this concept that disasters are predictably unpredictable events. So we know they're going to occur, we just don't know when. Sometimes we know what they're going to be. Uh, we know in the interior, we will always burn. We know that at the coast, there's seismic activity and concerns. So uh, we, we heard uh, you know, the mention of tsunami risk. We know that there will be flooding and I think we'll see more. And I think we, will, we are destined uh, due to, because of things like climate change to really um, experience these, these events on, on a much more ongoing basis. And then you throw in sort of the technological potential for transportation corridors and transportation accidents, um, throw in an infectious disease or a pandemic, uh, you know, and so these are predictably unpredictable events. I think it's also important to know that, you know, disasters are relative events. So what defines a disaster is when it exceeds the, your local capacity to manage. And so what may be a disaster in Logan Lake may not be a disaster in New Westminster, or it could be. But it make, what, it, what it does is it makes it all relatable to us, right? Um, I, as we saw this summer and uh, the fall in the last two years, um, almost all disasters involve healthcare and healthcare professionals and healthcare folks. And so this is why I think it's um, particularly important um, that we need to be aware of this and we need to, we need to you know, uh, start thinking about how do, we, uh, how do we manage these? How do we think about these more? How are we more ready for this, both on a personal level? Um, so you know, it's very, very difficult to, to work uh, when you're worried about your family, as Dr. Mo was, was, was mentioning. Right. Most of the time, you know, when we have these community events, many of us are first responders or responders because of healthcare. 
but we're also often potentially victims trying to connect with your family, right? Uh, July 1st, uh, our neighborhood in Juniper of about Kamloops, about 4,000 houses got evacuated because of a large interface wildfire that was lightning struck. And, and you live that experience of being uh, a responder and a victim. And that was my experience in, in Salmon Arm and, and probably in about half a dozen wildfires that I've been involved in. Um, so when, at a professional level, though, we think about, you know, um, is our offices or clinics prepared, right? As, at a community level, you know, what is the role of our divisions and our, are our divisions prepared to sort of help uh, our, our members in our communities, right? At a regional level, how are we linking in with, the, with our health authority partners? Uh, and then, of course, we can move into provincially, right? Um, this is particularly relevant in rural communities where many of the providers maybe work in the community, but they also work in a hospital. And so they play that dual role. And what sort of community resources, um, opportunities, things can we do to save our hospitals? Because, because in disasters, a lot of it focuses around the hospitals, but a lot of our resources are gonna be in the community. Uh, two other quick things. Disasters are cyclical, and I not not that I mean, but that they occur, you know, every year or every couple of years. But there's a cycle, right? There's this preparedness planning cycle that most of us are not involved in. There's a response which we all will get involved in, and then there's this recovery period afterwards, where you know uh, a lot of us like to forget what we just went through. But recovery is the first step of planning for the next one. And that brings me to the last point I want to mention is resilience. And what we want to have and what we are creating are resilient communities. And by resilience, I mean, not just a matter of being able to bounce back from an event, but how do we bounce back better? So some of the things we're talking about, about um, you know, um, better preparedness in the office, grab and go bags, how do we connect divisions into it? Um, you know, those are all tools and things that will make our communities that we work in and our families live in more resilient. So I think that's kind of what I wanted to set the flavor. We've experienced this. We will experience this again, unfortunately. Um, I'm not a doom and gloom person. I didn't start the wildfires or create the pandemic. But these are going to occur again. And I think it's really important that, you know, the opportunity is now to become even more connected with these sorts of things and learn from each other's experience. Thanks, Graham. Maybe I will share my screen uh, and maybe I'll be able to sort of tie in um, all of the pieces. So Graham's talking about um, thinking about it from the from your practice being ready and then divisions connecting in and then how does that connect in with the health authority how do we connect in with other divisions and how does that sort of move up the move up the chain so i'll share a couple of things um, with you some of you may have seen this already um, can you all see that just trying to There we go. So we were fortunate enough as a division um, to get some money prior to COVID um, from shared care to support um, emergency preparedness and response for physicians. And so the three sort of buckets of work in that were um, utilizing the Victoria practice resources that were developed in 2015 and, and updating those a little bit so that we could share those with practices and, and help to get those practices ready. The other um, component to that project was then formalizing a partnership and a connection point in with the health authority. And then we also wanted to figure out a networking system to network our members into the division and into each other during an emergency. So we start with um, we started with our own uh, creating our own incident command structure, which is the same emergency management structure that the health authority uses. 
So we created um, our own incident command structure in which we created as part of that, we took our region um, and we broke it into subsectors. And so we attached a staff person and a physician lead to each of those subsectors within the Thompson region. And we use that as a connection point into all of the members and back and forth into the members. During COVID, we surveyed our membership on a regular basis to find out what they needed, um, what support they were looking for, how they were doing, how they were transitioning to virtual care. And then we were able to take that information in-house, but then the second connection point was the Health Authority's Local Incident Command. So this is sort of the next communication place. So we started at the incident command and then as the pandemic went along and through the wildfires and floods, we were able then to ensure that all divisions had representation at the local incident command, which then now allows us to hear at the health authorities local incident command what other divisions need and we were able to sort of connect in with other divisions, uh, primarily during the wildfires. During COVID, we also um, created this clinical working group, um, which we did end up having some uh, division representation from um, some of our other rural communities out of the Thompson region that were part of the rural and remote division. And then we also had the connection point into our uh, collaborative services committee as well as into our interior division network. So when we talk about collective impact and communication, we now were able to have connection point in from the members to the division, from the division to the health authority and to the other divisions um, in, the, in the interior. And that's really where we were able to get that good communication and working relationship going. And really that is where the work with Dr. Mo um, fell out of was the health authorities incident command because we were able to go to the incident command and we were able to flag it as a concern and then offline, we were able to work with the health authority to develop a plan so that when Dr. Mo, if was evacuated, she would know where to go and we would be able to work with the health authority to find her another place to, um, to operate her business. And we were also during the wildfires um, through the incident command in touch with rural and remote to find out, you know, do you need support in Merritt? Do you need support in, in Lytton? How can we support back and forth? Um, so I wanted to, to share that uh, with you. And then the other piece that I wanted to share is um, just really quickly, I will. So now we are also, oh, hang on. I need to get it in my other document. So the other thing that we have done is, can you all see that now? So because during COVID, we initially, so initially before COVID, we wanted to make sure that we um, got our practices in order and their houses in order so they could respond to their own emergency, but then COVID hit and we were into the partnership work. And so now we're circling back to this. So um, recognizing Doctors of BC is also here to talk about, I think some contingency um, documentation. So we've created those practice resources that I was telling you about. So in honor of Dr. Mo and all the work, we have her as the face of our information book. Um, and so really these, this is a guidebook that will help each practice and any practice across the province to really develop your evacuation plan, your shelter in place plan, your incident recovery plan, which includes your contingency inventory. And then it also has information about how you would educate your staff and do um, regular drills and training um, around your plan. So the, the guidebook really just takes you through what each component is, why it's impo important and, and what you need to do to create your plans. So an evacuation plan, and then your shelter in place plan, and then your contingency inventory. But really the magic I think is in your workbook. So then we have a workbook that will be a fillable PDF that you, you'll be able to connect in with this on our, on our website. Um, and here is where you, it's just all fillable. So it walks you through your critical contacts. It walks you through how to create your evacuation plan. It talks about your procedure notes. It gives you guidance on things to think about um, when you're thinking about your developing your evacuation plan. It talks about your emergency equipment list. I think Graham talked a little bit about your grab and go bag. So it has ideas for that. So by the time you're done, 
you'll have all of those pieces, you'll print it off, you're going to practice it uh, at least once a year. Um, and we've even done, we've even given you, I'm just going to scroll down to the incident recovery piece. So your incident recovery piece um, really uh, talks about, we've done a post-emergency debrief. So you could do that with your, with your staff and yourself. And then it talks about what are those critical business contacts that you will need if you're evacuated in zero to 24, 24 to 48 hours and ongoing. Um, and then it has a list of business business and critical contacts that you can fill in the information for, and it gives you a bunch of blanks as well. It also talks about human resource documentation that you probably want to make sure you document and know where it is in your office. And then we have a practice and review section, which actually provides you some ideas um, for emergency uh, tabletops or drills. Um, and we'll have these ready for everyone in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, so I think that's what we what we wanted to share with you. And, and interestingly, we used Dr. Mo as one of our test sites when we were looking at the practice resources. And so it was interesting to work through with her um, what she would need and the nuances um, in the fact that she's in a health authority building, but yet she has her own practice within that. So how then does the health authorities, buildings, evacuation, shelter in place, how do those connect in with what she needs? So when we help her to develop her resources, it will be heavily, um, will heavily support her on developing that incident recovery piece. But then we will also connect in with the health authorities, HEMBC coordinator to talk to him about how we're supporting her and then how does it link in with what they're doing in the clinic. So there's all these like really great pieces and, um, and interesting nuances in, the, in sort of the test sites that we've already, we've already done. And so as part of our practice development work, we'll be, support, we'll be helping and supporting um, physicians to get these in their offices, and we'll also be developing a webinar. So that will also be for um, anybody and, uh, and everyone to, to see as well. So that's how we've connected all the dots. So, uh, sorry, I, now my computer's died, so I'm on my phone. Um, thanks for, Rhonda, that's great work. That's fabulous. And, and this is something we can all use. And, and, and when, when is your, your um, information session going to be? Yeah, so I think the information session probably, John, won't happen until April. Um, but we should have the resources ready to launch here. We're just, we're just finalizing the, um, the fillable PDF document. And so we will be sharing that out with everyone uh, as soon as we can. So I will, I will do that in multiple ways. So you'll all have it. Uh, that's great work. And uh, is there anyone from, from the health authority here? Do we know? If not, if not, John, there's, there's one other piece that I can share and well, and, but I, I think Lucas is here as well from GPSC. So, um, yeah, and just, just in speaking about the work that's happening with GPSC is one of the other pieces that will be coming out and um, we're going to be doing that in conjunction with um, EMBC and Kootenai Boundary Division is um, creating a, a division toolkit as well that will talk about how the divisions can create their own um, emergency response plan and how the incident command structure could work for divisions and how it could scale up and down. Um, and we'll be doing uh, a webinar, I think, with GPSC. I think that's at the end of March. So that'll be a provincial webinar um, on that. And as well at that time, um, EMBC will talk about um, health authorities and the connection point in for health authorities to divisions also, is my understanding. So that's very exciting. Yeah, this is good. I, I think it's, I mean, I guess in a, in a, in a way it's, it's unfortunate that we have to have a disaster before we kind of do this work that the last time uh, when in after 2017, I guess it was, or maybe it was, anyways, it was a, a while ago, uh, Graham will remember we, the doctors of BC did a plan for, for emergency response for physicians, but it was nowhere near as, 
uh, I don't think it was as good as what you guys put together here. And it was a little bit, had a little bit of a different focus and perhaps needs to be reworked. It was more how physicians interact with other uh, provincial agencies in response to a disaster. I must say that, uh, um, you know, and I'd be interested in hearing other people's opinion about how well um, some of the uh, interactions between our divisions and the physicians within them and the health authority went. Uh, uh, both with the pandemic and with the fires. And, and I guess the question I always have is, did our work that we'd already done uh, in response to the pandemic and the relationships we formed prior to that um, contribute significantly to the success of, of what we did during the fires? And uh, um, it's not worth, worth considering that. Um, so now Cheryl, I think, is the next person to, to speak about things just from a uh, more from a provincial perspective, I guess. I can now definitely say good afternoon instead of good morning or than earlier. <laughs> um, so yes, we did introductions already. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. Um, uh, business pathways, a little bit about um, contingency and then um, uh, funding piece, which is um, exciting because it's new funding. So, um, okay, so the first part, um, and this overlaps a bit with what Rhonda had shared. So there's a new um, section of Dr. Zabisi called Business Pathways, not to be confused with the pathways that um, people are more familiar with, which um, regarding referrals and, and community resources and things. So this is really um, very resource-based. It's not so much um, like that hands-on direct help um, that can be provided. Um, I'll just do a really quick screen share if it's, oh, there I think it is. Um, so it's very similar components, um, and this is not tailored to a specific division. Um, it can be utilized by um, uh, specialists as well. So it, it very similar components to what um, Rhonda was discussing. Um, and this is about a 16 page document. So there's a few different pieces in there. There's some um, information about uh, Westland Insurance specifically, because that's primarily um, what physicians um, are using. There's also uh, templates in here as well, um, like contact list, communication plans, critical record inventories, um, some of the role descriptions, for example, uh, of the of the different um, roles that people would be taking on in in a clinic, um, like your emergency warden who's who's grabbing the um, the go kits, for example, or somebody who's in charge of the different EMR pieces. So um, so very similar um, as you're seeing, just for some of those components. Um, and then there's also a piece. Sorry, I know I'm scrolling pretty quick through here, but just kind of gives you an idea. Um, and then there's also at the the end, there's um, there's a couple of questions that uh, can help guide um, just for legal consultation. Um, so that's a, it's another additional resource. Obviously, there's there's several um, resources available, which is um, awesome. Um, and uh, just to stress again, um, it's not. A sir, like a one on one service to help walk through that it's it's more specifically that resource um, on the topic of the contingency planning, you know, this has come up with the college very recently and many physician questions that have been submitted. Um, there was I think it's literally yesterday, there was some additional messaging, um, some clarification uh, that Dr. Zabisi had gotten from the college. So I'll just touch on a couple of those. Um, because they do obviously pertain to this topic. Uh, it was not in regards to long-term planning for physicians for contingency planning. It's specific to short-term um, plans um, just to have arrangements in place. It certainly can be um, arrangements within a group practice, but obviously um, when there's a disaster, if the short-term um, leave, it's not due to an illness, uh, if that physician is having to evacuate and that group practice is co-located, obviously, um, having those arrangements within that group practice 
those other physicians aren't able to cover for those patients. So there were um, a number of communities in the interior that um, physicians were connecting with other physicians in other communities um, to link in with them in case uh, they needed to evacuate. And unfortunately, obviously, as we heard, um, that was the case for, for several physicians. Um, and then uh, the last piece, I'll just touch on that contingency part. There's not a, um, physicians do not have to provide a written plan um, to the college, uh, or, nor um, have an agreement, like a legal um, agreement in place, but they're asking that um, arrangements have been made with another, um, with another provider. And then the last piece I'll just touch on, so there is new funding. Um, I think John had just mentioned it takes those those crises for these um, things to be in place, but there is new funding um, this coming fiscal year for health emergency management funding for divisions. Um, and it's kind of twofold. So there will be some additional funds for emergency responses. So um, uh, really as, as Rhonda had sh um, shown in that graph, if there are, um, I don't want to speak, uh, I of the, the rural and remote division as a whole. Um, Lord knows, I, we hope that not the whole division would be involved in a disaster. That would be a widespread provincial, <laughs> um, that would be awful. So, but if there is chapters that are involved in a disaster um, and whatever phase of the response that it is, if it's going to incident command or if it's more planning like for um, the recovery phase, there will be emergency funding um, in place that divisions can access and, and that would be accessible both for a physician lead attending as well as um, division staff attending those. And then there's another going to be um, another component of that, which is for the planning. So um, that can be, so, and I should clarify, not for individual physician contingency planning time, but for the division planning time on that chapter level planning time um, for uh, making, developing those plans with health authority partners, um, often municipal partners, things like that for those responses. Um, and it was a mentioned earlier tabletop exercises. So this, um, that is something that you could bring up with your CSC co-chairs. I completely recognize this is not something that happens commonly across the whole province. Um, there are divisions in the interior who have participated in tabletop exercises with the health authority. Um, and so that does give you a, um, a precedent or something to lean on to if, you know, in case there's any hesitancies in the region, but it, uh, yes, thank you. Sorry, Sarah, <laughs> thank you. Um, the acronyms just, just uh, dominate our our day-to-day -day, don't they so yes thank you um the collaborative services committee meeting so if that's something that you want to explore um uh, partnering with the health authority in interior health the divisions are on that org chart for part of that disaster response um acknowledging that there's four different health authorities uh, that the chapters are spread across um uh, I realize that's not the case for, for everybody represented here. So, but that um, it, it is something that you could bring up at the Collaborative Services Committee if that's something that you wanted to, um, to participate in. And that's uh, something that the funding um, could be used to support in terms of planning. Um, I think that's it for, for me. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, that was great. Uh, it's good to know that uh... Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, that the uh, once uh, once a disaster happens and people start to think about, oh, how can we deal with the next one? Uh, and uh, so, I, I, is is Duncan still here? John, I'm here. Yeah, so, yeah, Duncan, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, you know moving from fires to floods? Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, and maybe the fire too, just about your and Merritt's experience during these disasters and, and how things worked out. Yeah, um, okay, I'll try to make it brief, although it seemed to, well, it was, it was a huge event. Like, yeah, as you pointed out, there was a initial early fire, then there was the heat dome. We just watched things dry out like crazy. 
And then we just slowly watch this sort of an, an inexorable uh, approach of these three tongues of fire. So just my own personal experience, I was, I think it was August 15th, which was like the, the, the penultimate day of it. I could see three fires blazing on the horizon. I was up all night with like a sprinkler hose at, at my place, literally like a fire hose I'd purchased, soaking down everything I could because my neighbors had already been evacuated and I was one of those sort of stick in the muds. And I'd already had some fence posts burned by a previous small fire, which was just this kooky quirk of fate where in the middle of the heat dome, a, 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 some guy with a pickup truck that was spewing sparks uh, drove about 10 kilometers between this town and, and between Merritt and, and Logan Lake. And uh, I think he started something like seven or 11 fires on the way. So I had a fire on either side of my place in the dry grass, burning the fence posts and things. So this was uh, sort of uh, all consuming, I guess, from a physician point of view and, and, and from a you know, personal point of view for many individuals in town. And, um, you know, we had our little squad of almost like the Ukrainian resistance out there in, in the bush um, working on fire mitigation for, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the properties that were later destroyed by flood, people were rounding up cattle and all this kind of craziness. And they were not, um, you know, they were not, they, they, they could not leave their places. They had too much to do. And they could not depend. I, I think that there were a lot of people that didn't feel that they could depend on 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 the finite resources of a fire uh, cruise when there were literally three fires headed for merit. Uh, anyway, so that was the setting. Um, you know, when we underwent our our evacuation, which I think was around. Um, sorry, our our high alert and evacuation of some of the immediate vicinity. Um, um, you know, we, we, we watched our, our hospital patients and uh, long-term care be uh, distributed to other places in the province. I think professionally, the most distressing slightly, you know, um, just, just a professionally distressing element of that, which I think certainly bears discussion, was uh, just this idea of handover and how uh, helter-skelter it was. I really, you know, I, I we we didn't we just felt like the patients were literally picked up and 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 sent away and um you know there wasn't a lot of closure in terms of being able to have a you know much of a pre or kind of a, a cover note for any individual patient or um you know or having a doctor to phone to to, to hand over and i i talked about this with diana peters quite a bit afterward um uh, just the stresses involved from both our end of, of just having our patients disappear. I mean, it was convenient, but, uh, um, and, and necessary. Um, and I guess somewhat convenient not to have to make a bunch of phone calls and try to figure out who to call literally for, for, for many, you know, dozens of patients. Um, but, uh, um, on, on the other hand, there was this kind of uncomfortable silence after the people disappeared and you didn't I think I got one call from from one guy in Williams Lake I, I can't remember the doctor's name but other than that you kind of thought you'd maybe get a, a phone call and uh, and it, it didn't seem to happen so so whether they were just taking pity on us and making do with with a lot of the patients or um, as far as handover I got the sense that was probably it but I think in future we'd we'd have to really extend our, uh, our 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 you know cell phone numbers and say please call if this patient arrives on your doorstep just to complete that collegial loop of handover and um, uh, that that was kind of what we arrived at as a as a key professional point if if it happens again. Okay, so that was kind of the fire thing, and then of course three months to the day later was was this flood, and and um, it was really quite. It, it was quite something. It was like just, uh, you know, a, a TV moment. Um, you know, you hear about these things in other places. I think France or Germany was really rubbed out big time by a flood last year, too. And, 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 and uh, you know, he, here it was out of nowhere. And um, the devastation, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to 
poke around merit. I think pe people, it, it, you know, enough times past, there's still a lot of devastation to be witnessed um, just roaming around that phase three and four. But, um, um, you know, the, the, the process was somehow familiar. You know, all the patients, obviously, as well as all the people in town were, were, were taken away. And there was this kind of, again, this weird silence around town. And, and then, of course, this sort of martial law experience we all had as the, you know, the gate, the gatekeepers set up their, their outposts and, and were fairly, you know, fairly uh, imperious in their kind of, uh, you know, persecution of their duties, kind of, they, they, uh, they um, um, prosecution, I guess, but it, in any case, they, uh, they would, you know, not seem to discriminate, they would turn you away. Eventually, we got a kind of green bracelets for the docs that were trying to go to, to keep working. Certainly, Dr. McLeod was like, hardly missed a beat. And I think the rest of us uh, kind of, wherever we were positioned, um, we managed to sneak our way into town and and carry on with our telephone um, business. And certainly uh, having that whole year of, or whatever it is, yeah, a good year or two, a year and a half of telephone medicine was almost a gift because it was like, you know, clinical practice wise, we, we hardly missed a beat. And, um, but the, uh, yeah, the displacement and the displacement that's still going on is, is it, it's really huge. It's, it's really, huge I you see some of the patients you're talking to that are still displaced and they're just you know they're really at their wits end and uh, the uh, the sort of sadness of those devastated areas is it just it just lingers I mean the enormity of picking up even you know this eight or ten inches of mud in a lot of places is, it's just beyond imagining if you had a any personal connection to it, friends to help clean up. It, it was just heartbreaking work because you 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 literally could barely move this mud with a shovel. You, you you couldn't. It was so sticky. By the time the main water dragged away, and and then and then and you were dealing with this clay like um, mud. Um, it it's really you know it's really uh, just just kind of. Uh, a stupefying how difficult the cleanup element is so much of the town that's been wrecked still looks kind of wrecked there's there's piles of mud where machines have been working there's just still piles of debris and, and insulation and everything and and uh, <clears throat> you know the weight is heavy on 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 the townspeople i would say 300 houses more or less wrecked Lot, lots of lots of uh demolished or condemned houses and um, pretty, pretty, pretty heavy, pretty heavy. So uh, I don't know where I was going with that. That's just basically the, the summary of my own experience. And I think the main take home point uh, professionally was just the sense of, you know, next time we send all our people out, it would be kind of nice to be able to hand over and at least feel that that was um, somehow official. I'm just all I, I can just see you, John, there. But I guess uh, I'll just leave it at that. If anybody has any questions or if there's anything that I should add, let me know. Well, thanks, Duncan. That was a, a great summary and, and some good points. Um, and I think that um, we don't have any other scheduled people to speak, but I'm really interested in, in hearing the views of anybody else here that has some point that they want to make about how to how to deal with things better next time things that weren't went well uh, things that didn't go well and questions about processes hi john uh, it's sarah um just wanted to mention as well that for folks who aren't involved in um emergency support services and the emergency management um area of things there's a lot of work that's happening behind the scenes during these disasters and folks can feel really uh, marooned and isolated not knowing that there's you know a, a, 
an incident command committee for interior health. The province is working on things. Municipalities are working on things. And uh, so I just want folks to know that there is a lot happening that you might not know about. And there are definitely resources that you can reach out um, uh, to for help. Uh, and I just put one in the chat box there. With divisions, our local health planning tables uh, have really been um, helpful during these disasters. And th they represent various health services in local communities. And we're able to connect folks, um, whether they be patients or the uh, disaster response teams, directly to people um, as needed. So that has been a huge advantage as well. And Catherine, you had your hand up, but I don't see. Yeah, I'll be really brief. I know you want to do a couple questions at the end too, but I just wanted to point out um, or ask you, Sarah, about the involvement of the local health planning table, because I think that just looked different in each one of our chapters. And I thought it was such a win that the municipality reached out to you and used that local health planning table as um, a place to provide updates and obviously give and receive information. So I thought that was a real win. And it's interesting because at first we thought, oh, things aren't working very well. We're not hearing what we need to hear from the community. But the reality was, is that there are, there are so many glitches along the way. And it ended up being just an administrative error that a couple of people were left off to an email list. And it was an old list that somebody was using. And in fact, they were trying to involve partners. So I think just trying to remember that we're all in this together and we're all doing this with our best intent and to sort of wade through this without... Uh, emotion attached sort of really helped and and uh, once we realized the where the problem was stemming from it was resolved relatively easily and uh, everybody was involved so that was great. I also had a question quickly for Rhonda just around um, in your HEMS work that you guys have done I'm curious if the um, topic of physician compensation like in an APP model came up to respond to these things. Um, obviously fee for service doesn't work if you're getting in a helicopter and flying out to see four patients in a day that, that obviously desperately need that care but can't access it any other way. So in a couple of our communities, we did have physicians doing that and you know you have to make a, a quick decision to do that and you don't have time to meet with the local health planning table and your health authority partners, medical affairs to get everything sort of set up for that. Um, and so I know, you know, we're working with Ian Wood at Interior Health to look at, at what that might look like to set something up so that you could quickly sort of say, okay, we're in emergency management now, we need to um, implement some kind of an APP model. And I'm curious if you guys touched on that in your work at all. Yeah, great question, Catherine. And no, we haven't touched on that, but we've just made that connection point with EMBC and, and like on that provincial level. Um, so I think that's a, a, a great a great piece that we can yeah bring back to that sort of the working group with GPSC and EMBC and yeah be a good yeah so thanks for flagging that. Thanks, Rhonda. And just to respond, Catherine, to your to your point about um, uh, including the local planning table, um, the morning of the Lytton evacuation on. July 1st, of course, was Canada Day. Uh, and being a stat holiday, um, it's hard to get health services. And so we had all sorts of folks come to town with all sorts of needs. And uh, it was really, um, really wonderful to see members of the, of the local health table actually reaching out to me first to say, hey, how can I help? You know, what's needed? And then we were able to quickly get folks. Um, uh, support, whether it be mental health or prescriptions or, uh, or what have you. And um, so we were able to do that as well with the flooding here when the municipality was trying to um, bring folks back. We, we needed to make sure we were involving those health services so that the supports would be there for mental health and substance use clients. Um, supports would be there for our long-term care and so on and so forth. So it really was beautiful how that co collaboration worked. And then also having divisions um, reach out to us um, as well. Thompson, um, thank you, Rhonda and all uh, at Thompson Division, they sorted out clinic space in Kamloops for our doctors if they needed to use it. Um, so there, there are really advantages to having those partnerships.
Any uh, more hands up, Sarah? Anybody else wants to ask questions or talk about stuff? No hands up, but if anybody wants to jump in, please feel free. I was just gonna commend you, Sarah, for that work. I, I forgot to mention that whole element of the, uh, you know, people coming here from out, outer, you know, the outer reaches, um, like the, you know, the Lytton people and, and, you know, how you jumped in was just really awesome. Uh, you were kind of, you know, a main player here with the quarterbacking of all that. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that was really great. I mean, there was, uh, I was just, we, we, uh, I was just thinking of, you know, life goes on in terms of, of medicine sometimes. And, you know, even when Logan Lake got evacuated, we had a, you know, an evacuated uh, maid patient, medical assistance and dying that needed, you know, that was scheduled to have his maid like the day after the evacuation. So there was a bit of, you know, scrambling, but, you know, it was able to happen. And, and um, so, um, yeah, it, it, some of the acute stuff is, is just in real time just happening and you just have to kind of deal with it. it. You know, this current thing in Ukraine really made me think of that. You know, you, you can watch all this war stuff on TV and, and, you know, people are, you know, still needing their medicines and their oxygen and they're still having babies and all, all the rest of it. You know, 44 million people. It's just, it, it, it just really put in perspective what we went through. It, it was on a mini scale compared to that, but, uh, you know, life goes on even with all these crises and you just kind of try to do whatever you can do. So, but thank you again for all your efforts with, with quarterbacking things that, uh, you know, the, that really, I think we really made a difference accommodating the Lytton people and, um, you know, their, their tragedy is, I would say, uh, it's got to be on a much larger scale than ours, but uh, it was nice to, to be able to, to know that Merrick was, you know, a brother to them in that circumstance or sister city or whatever you might call it. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. And I think uh, we're out of time. Is that not right, Sarah? That's it. Any yeah. other questions, so, maybe? I just want to say welcome to Chris, who has recently joined us. He is the chapter coordinator for Lillooet and Lytton. I did not expect him to see on the call today, but he also was the pharmacist in Lytton for 26 years and did lose his pharmacy in that uh, horrific fire. And we are so lucky to have him on our team now um, in the rebuild and, and all of that. And so just so glad that he was able to, to jump on even if at the end here. And um, yeah, and I also was curious if we were gonna do a quick poll at the end of this, Sarah. That happens after we close out. Oh, sorry, okay, I thought it was a Zoom poll. And yeah. I just wanna thank John for hosting and all of our speakers today. It was uh, wonderful that you're able to share all this and um, it certainly helps uh, for everybody to be more prepared as these things happen. And uh, thanks to my, uh, my partner in organizing this, Shelly. Uh, really appreciate all your support as well. And, and just to note that this is recorded. And so if anybody knows somebody who wasn't able to make it and would like to think that they would want to listen to it, then I would assume that they would get a hold of you, Sarah, or who? Uh, sure. Yeah. Get a hold of me. Um, we won't put this out publicly. We might put it in the members only section on our website, but it's probably a huge file. So it might have to be done a different way. Perfect. Thanks everybody. I really, really appreciate all the work that went into this and, uh, particularly Sarah, uh, tremendous amount of work and, and everybody that helped you. Um, I, I do think it's a, you know, our response to disaster is a real reflection of, of the relationships we've built uh, within the division and the relationships we've built with other divisions and health authority over the past uh, couple of difficult years. And uh, um, just, I think it just made a world of difference is how well things worked. And John, I just, I'm impressed with your ability to host an entire meeting yet somehow walk around hallways the whole time. Well done. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.